Hi, it's Noel Williams, April 29th, 2020, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Optimal Health Associates. We're going to talk a little bit about COVID directly, but mostly we're going to talk about the immune system. There's a lot of misinformation about the immune system and how it works and what it does. There's a lot of lack of understanding about herd immunity. So let's talk about herd immunity. Herd immunity is a great concept scientifically and epidemiologists love it. And so let's talk about it. And one of the reasons I want to, I want to discuss this stuff is I watched a video that uh, patient Stephanie Hume hi, uh, and friends sent to me about uh, an ER doctor. It's been watched by about 1.9 million people. And he goes through some immune stuff saying that, you know, we need to, uh, get out there and get exposed to COVID and by not being exposed our immune systems are weakening He's making a central error and it's catastrophic and I feel bad for him because I know he doesn't mean to make this catastrophic error The immune system is not weakened or strengthened by exposure To things your immune system just is going to work or not work over time being exposed to different viruses and fungus give you antibodies, which I'm gonna go all into. If you've never been exposed to it, you don't have immune function to fight it. And that's the mistake. It's not an issue with function, it's an ability to respond. And if you have no ability to respond to a virus, you don't wanna get it. And it's not from having a weak immune system, it's just from not being exposed. It's like when the Christopher Columbus came over in 1492 and then the colon then the, all the colonies formed and all these people came over to North America how many Native Americans died in the next hundred years by around 1700 it was like 30 million or 40 million I uh, the exact number is this escaping me I've read several articles about it but it's from the cholera the typhoid all these things they'd never had and and it wasn't that they had weak immune systems they had never been exposed and so when you have deadly diseases it's a matter of not being exposed until we have a strategy to protect you or to give you immunity or a treatment strategy. So let's talk about the immune system first. Um, there's two parts of the immune system. You have your general immune system or innate immune system, and then you have your adaptive or responsive immune system. So your innate immune system is comprised of several different parts, um, actually tons, but I mean, it's your skin, it's the mucosal surfaces in your, your mouth, it's antibodies that are in your mouth, they're called IgA, um, immunoglobulin alpha antibodies that are there and they can attack um, viruses and proteins or viruses and bacteria and all kinds of stuff. Um, then you have leukocytes and that are white blood cells that will attack and try to kill um, bacteria. And then you have um, natural killer cells that actually kill your own cells that are infected. And so you have this whole complex of array of stuff that's really nonspecific, but it's just ready to go. Think of it, army. It's the army. It's ready to go all the time but it's not specialized. And so that's where your adaptive immune system comes in. So your adaptive immune system really starts focusing more on the humoral system or antibody development. There's still some cell mediated immunity with your adaptive system, but the main part, and cell mediated means a cell is directly involved. Either your natural killer cells have been targeted for it or your T4 helper cells are targeted um, to help fight the infection. But what happens with humoral immunity, it's your antibody production. And so you have B lymphocytes and you have other kinds of lymphocytes. And the B lymphocytes bind to the infectious agent and it, they bind and they bind to a, usually a protein on the surface of the infectious agent, which is a key step. But the other key step, which I should have said first is your immune system's number one thing is its ability to recognize a foreign substance, okay? It can tell the difference between you and something foreign. And so once your body has recognized it's a foreign event, so it's a virus, it's a fungus, it's a bacteria, it's a parasite, something like that, eventually your B cells get involved and they're going to bind to a protein on the surface of the infectious agent. And once they do that, they're going to, through a complex system with your T4 helper cells, start to make antibodies to inactivate or attempt to inactivate 
the infectious substance. And so first you make some antibodies called IgM, immunoglobulin M, and those occur within a week or so, and they build up. And then by about three to six weeks, your secondary antibodies that can give long-term immunity or show you've been exposed to something are called your IgG antibodies. And that's what's in breast milk and crosses to the baby. It also crosses um, from the mom's bloodstream to the baby when they're a woman's pregnant to give, and that's passive immunity because you have all these IgG antibodies that protect you from lots of stuff when you're a baby for the first six months. And, but that brings up a really interesting point is what about moms with children? How does it all work? Well, what happens when you're pregnant is your innate immune system goes down and your adaptive immune system goes down so you don't attack the placenta or reject the baby. And the interesting thing with COVID which is so important to understand is the thing that is killing people ultimately is the innate immunity system going awry. So when you get that initial infection and all your normal stuff, your white blood cells that are nonspecific, the antibodies you have around, the inflammasomes, your complement, all these things in your body that fight infection start to attack that virus. They go kind of out of control in some people and that's what leads to the pneumonia the acute respiratory distress syndrome and this massive inflammation and blood clots and heart events and that's what kills the patient it's the innate immunity going awry and so since in pregnant women the innate immunity is ratcheted down it turns out they're really not getting sick and so far the data is also showing all the people or most people on immunologic drugs that modify the innate immune system for rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's, all those kinds of things, they're not getting more sick because the issue is their innate immune system is ratcheted down. But it's an interesting, it's very interesting stuff. So then we go from this concept. So it's all about humoral immunity and you got to make those antibodies and you got to make them to this spike protein right here for my model and that will inactivate the virus. The problem with the COVID though, because you got to call it the COVID at this point, is that spike protein in a paper I mentioned last week and a second paper that came out last week has significant protein or antigenic vari variations. So getting one infection doesn't mean you're going to be protected from another infection. Now, since there's 30 different variants, I don't think you're going to need to get all 30 to be protected, but probably you're going to have to get several different v variations of the virus to be protected, or the vaccine will have to have several different antigenic components of various spike proteins in order to mount the antibody response. So again, it's your adaptive immune system, the humoral immunity, where you get the vaccine, it's a protein, your body recognizes it as foreign, your B cells bind to it, they get involved with the T4 helper cells, you make the antibodies, and then you have long-term immunity. But the problem is since there's variation on that spike protein, it's not gonna be quite as easy as we were hoping. So from there, let's talk about herd immunity. So herd immunity means the whole group is protected even though a few of the individuals may not have antibodies to the disease or the infectious agent. And so how much herd immunity or how long that takes involves with how infectious the agent is. If you look at mumps, measles, mumps, and rubella, on average it infected, infected if one person got it, it infected 10 to 12. So it took vaccinating about 93% of the population and then the other 7% didn't get it either at that point. When you look at COVID, there's still a lot of data that we don't know. So basic, making any decisions or recommendations on, oh, just go get infected or doing it like Sweden makes no sense because we don't know what's going on yet. But what we do know seems to indicate it's at least for every person infected, they infect three, maybe four or five, but three. And based on that, we won't get herd immunity till 70 to 80% of us have been infected with enough varieties that it then kind of, it doesn't spread person to person as much because if I'm immune, if there's 10 people in a room and eight of us are immune and then the virus comes in 
and it touches a, it's going to touch a few of us but most of the time it's going to touch people who are already infected so we're not going to get reinfected so then we won't give it to the next person so the concept of herd immunity is that there's enough of us infected or vaccinated because that's really what herd immunity is about herd immunity strategies are preventive but that only is preventive if you get a vaccine Herd immunity is not an, an, a, you don't want to search out herd immunity by getting everyone infected because if you do it through infection, people get sick and people die. So if you look at COVID, anyone saying, well, maybe we can do a herd immunity strategy, kind of which is what this silly but very nice doctor was saying, is a disaster because if you look at the data, it's between best case of one half percent to one percent die. And if you look at Sweden right now, it's 12. Then it's not going to be 12, but it's probably going to be somewhere around 1%. One, a 1% 1 death rate is a disaster. It breaks, uh, it kills 80 to 90 million people in the world, and it breaks the healthcare systems because there's going to be another half billion people who are significantly ill. So what we have to do is still mitigate and try to avoid infections. And now I'm not saying keeping everything locked down. I've moved so much beyond that now. I think what we have to do is augment immune function with zinc and all the other things I've said. We need to wear masks, we need to wash our hands, we need to be smart. But we still need to mitigate because we need time to have a long-term strategy. So if we get to the nitty-gritty of what this physician said, uh, and he talked about, well, look at Sweden as a success story, and the World Health Organization said Sweden's a success story. And those of you who've watched me before, um, no, the World Health Organization isn't a success story. We do not know if Sweden's been a success story. But if we just look at some basic numbers, it's, it doesn't seem to me that they're a success story. Let's look at Korea. They were a success story, which the World Health Organization did say was. They had 8,000 patients infected within about two weeks. Four and a half, five weeks later, they're at about 10,300. Their total deaths were 240 total. And they were booming as bad as we were. But they shut down the country for a solid three to four weeks, but not completely, but shut it down. They did massive testing, which is everything, and isolated people. You look at Norway. Norway's had a very conservative approach, too. They have five million people in the country. They have about 7,700 infections. They have 209 deaths. Very successful. You look at Sweden, who just kind of was a little more fly by night, and I don't mean that meaningly, just they were, they made that rationally though. And keep in mind, Sweden and Norway are two of the healthiest countries in the world with the lowest risk of heart disease, hypertension, um, diabetes. I mean, they're the healthiest groups, okay? So it's really interesting to compare Norway to Sweden. And then you look at Sweden, it has 10 million people. They've had 20,000 infections versus, you know, let's say eight. They've had 2,500 deaths versus 209. So even if you, if you normalize the populations, um, Sweden has three times the number of deaths, the three and a half times the number of deaths as Norway. And that doesn't look good when you're starting to see, hmm, their death rate is massively higher, their infection rate was much greater, and that doesn't make them a model. Okay, and so their concept was, well, hey, we can handle this. We're healthy, which I completely agree with, because if we did this in the United States, our death rate would have been 12.5% instead of 6% too. But the mistake they're making is thinking that the antigenic exposure from the virus is just one viral type. And so there's not going to be, oh, was it goes through and this time 20% of the population got it, which is best case scenario. The antibody data that's coming out now from all over the world is not showing this massive prevalence rate in the population. It's probably gonna run around seven to 10% of the populations at most. And so it's gonna one come back through the one that they've had, but so are potentially 29 or 30 different other versions. So even the people who've had the initial infection can get sick again and could die. And that's what is happening in China and that's what's happened in Korea. So you have to understand these concepts and not listen to people who don't understand things correctly. The immune system works 
unless you have AIDS or some very odd thing going on. Your immune system will develop humoral immunity against infectious agents as it gets exposed to them over time. But the problem with exposure over time to deadly diseases is sometimes it just kills you before you can get a response. And so that's the problem with COVID. And so to not understand that is a global misunderstanding, is just, is a mistake. And I'm sorry. And again, the one thing I'm noticing is if you say anything against the World Health Organization, and I've seen this both in Yahoo and Google and Dr. Fauci, um, who, again, I've had my differences of opinion with for what it's worth, is now you're a conspiratist against them because you just can't have an opinion. And so tomorrow night we are going to talk about Dr. Fauci um, raving about this antiviral, um, which I read a paper today from that was a study out of Asia, which showed that they were very underwhelmed with it. Um, the rim is of their, the deer, however you say it. Um, they were very underwhelmed with it in this trial in China or Korea or somewhere other. Um, but I'll put that out. And so I don't know. I'm not thinking that it's going to be the, the wonderful solution and that they're thinking. But if it is, it's great. It's great. But I, again, the FDA is looking for big time solutions and is never going to bring up, hey, let's augment your immune system, which is really what I think this doctor was talking about. How do we make our immune system stronger? It's not by 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 washing the counters off. That does not make your immune system weaker. That has no effect. It's take your vitamins, eat well, be healthy. Um, stop smoking. Um, if you have apnea, get it treated. You have to take care of yourself these days. Um, and that's really my summary for tonight is trying to get these concepts about the immune system going because if you don't understand the immune system, which you shouldn't have to be, I shouldn't have to explain to you because you don't need to know it. That's my job. But when someone's putting out just the wrong information and doesn't understand it and they're a physician, it's kind of tragic. So I felt like it needed to be addressed tonight. So take care. Good night. And so long. What about oh. the neti pot tomorrow? Oh, oh, yes. The neti pot. There's some, I do want to bring up just very quickly. I'll go over neti pots and irrigation, uh, the nasal pharynx, uh, pharyngeal area tomorrow. There's some really good thoughts on uh, saline uh, rinses or, and it can be hypertonic or isotonic saline. Um, and what it's going to do to the nasal pharyngeal cavity and prevent infections. And it actually is great for allergy prevention. I mean, I'm learning all this stuff that I never knew because I'm a gynecologist, so I don't have to uh, know as many things as I, well, I always need to know more stuff, but I'm learning all kinds of new things. And thanks. And I can thank uh, Dr. Uh, Vince Montgomery, great oral surgeon down in Norman for getting me turned on to this and some of my other dental friends and ENT friends. So uh, thank you and good night. Thank you.